All right. I think we are now in business. We may be joined by other members of our party here a little later, but you know it is Sunday night. Oh, no. Right? It's Sunday night, so we're kind of wrapping things up. Once again, Cosmic Summit 2024. Have you all had a wonderful time? Are you entertained? Yeah. Now listen, this panel discussion is going to be the icing on the proverbial cake, so make it fun. We've got microphones out there for you. We'd like to hear from you in the audience and also from those out there who are watching online. We'll be fielding questions from the app. But if you want to jump up to that microphone here and you are here present, we'd like to hear from you. We've got lots of speakers, lots of great minds here on stage. I'm sure you have questions. So now will be the time to get those in. So I'm going to do a quick 20-minute introduction where I introduce each and every one of these people. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right, right. I think at this point, it's safe to say you probably have a good idea of who we have up here. And therefore, we're going to play a little game as we kick things off. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to go right to Hugh Newman. All right, Hugh, listen. Let's get down to brass tacks here. Go Beckley Tepe, right? We've got some sites that are speculated to be older than Go Beckley Tepe. You know the site managers. You've been to these locations. You've spotted things at some of these sites that others have not. So lead this panel off for us. Tell me what we can expect in the next 48 months at sites in Turkey, which is, by all intents and purposes, the new Egypt in some ways. How do we see this sh taking shape, and what do you envision will be the next wave of discovery? There's, there's a lot coming out of southeast Turkey. There's a lot coming out of there. It's crazy. They now estimate there's 38 sites on par with Gebekli Tepe, which will date back to a similar era around 9,600 BC or thereabouts. So there's going to be a few sites going to start excavation in the next couple of years, and they're bigger and more spectacular, potentially, than Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. So there's quite a lot to you know consider when you're looking at this area. It's not just Gebekli Tepe, it's not Karahan Tepe. There's a, what I call a super civilization, the first in the planet, existing at the end of the last ice age. And now you ask about older sites, there's many of the sites that are being discovered now are older than this, and they actually go into the Ice Age. So maybe what Graham Hancock says, that there's an Ice Age civilization, an advanced civilization, might be true. The evidence is coming together to support this. Fantastic. Luke Caverns, I'm going to come over to you for a moment here. You dropped quite a bombshell on us the other day during your incredible talk on the Olmec Enigma. Now, I, I have to ask you that final slide, and for anybody out there who hasn't seen this yet, remember, if you go on the Cvents app, you can actually access all of the videos of the presentations that you may have missed. I doubt most of them missed yours, but let me ask you right now, if anyone did, tell us a little bit about the handbag in the final frame, the implications of what this could potentially mean, and its worldliness in terms of how this motif shows up throughout so many different cultures. Luke? Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, so the handbag, it's, uh, it's very popular iconography in the ancient world. You see it on Monument 19 at Laventa, the Olmec man being carried by the feathered serpent holding the handbag. But we also see it in... Um, in, I guess, first millennium BC, uh, Mesopotamia as well. We see it on two different friezes. And then, you know, you may see a handbag at Gobekli Tepe. And I had always thought, you know, I don't know about the one at Gobekli Tepe. If there was any other way, if I ever saw another example, maybe it would be something that I would uh, put at the front of my mind. And on a recent uh, expedition into the Olmec heartland, really just a couple of months ago, I was at the city called Kakashla, which uh, a volcano had erupted around 800 AD and completely buried the city um, under ash in the same way that Pompeii had been buried under ash and perfectly preserved. And when I was going through this site, I looked at one of the frescoes and it depicted, to my amazement, I, I actually st still can't believe that I saw this. Um, I took a photo of it. It was, in, it was at my presentation. It was a a Veracruz culture man holding a handbag, left hand down, right hand up, in the exact same position um, as the other three certain examples of handbags. And so it's something that I deemed the fourth handbag. And I asked a local archaeologist what he thought this might be. And, you know, he, he's not uh, privy to this 
uh, mystery or this anomaly that we all are of these different handbags found throughout the world, but he told me that it was indicative of a shaman that was traveling to or from Kakashla um, and that the bag probably had psychedelics in it. And um, so I guess the implication of that is that whatever this iconography is that seems to permeate its way through the ancient world, um, it, I think that it has something to do with ancient psychedelics and uh, carrying knowledge of some kind. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, I still have a lot more research to do about it. Indeed. We'll be eager to hear more about that. And in the meantime, if anyone out there has a handbag with psychedelics in it, please report to the stage. We'll be eager to hear from you this evening. <laughs> right here. My man's always got my back right here. Jumping down here to Paul Shatskin. Now listen, Paul, the, man, the other man on stage with Chuck Taylor's on, let me ask you this. You told us the story of the man who invented anti-gravity. My question for you, and maybe this is slightly conspiratorial, where did anti-gravity research in the United States go? Underground? Is it hidden? Does it exist at all? Your thoughts? Well, this is what, what made developing that story so hard, is because when we're talking about something that may have gone black, there's no evidence of it. And uh, I got a lot of input over the course of the six years that I researched the story that was so confounding that I actually walked away from it. After researching the story from 2003 to 2009 and then writing that 500-page first draft, I realized I really didn't have a handle on the material because it is, as you say, very controversial. And as Hal Pudoff says in the presentation, we don't know if we, they didn't get anywhere or if it just went black. And, and when I reached the point where I didn't have a solid answer to that question, I walked away from the project for 13 years. And I came back to it in 2022 um, just because I had reached another turning point in my life and I thought it was time to do something with the material and I did the best I could with it. So uh, I, I don't have a definitive answer for you. I would, I would pose the question that uh, Hal Pudoff posed. Either nothing came of it or it went black. And the problem with saying it went black is that that then challenges our concept of reality. I, I often use the example, do you all, did any of you see the, uh, the TV show Westworld on HBO? It was made by Christopher Nolan's brother, Jonathan Nolan, and his wife. And, and there's the point in that series where the, the kind of like the, the, the android master asks the androids, do you ever question the nature of your reality? And if the, if the androids are questioning their reality, then they're, they're becoming sentient. And that is the problem with coming up with a definitive answer to whether or not the anti-gravity work went black. Because to believe that it did, we then have to question the nature of our reality. Very well said. If anybody has any leads on where that anti-gravity research went, you can reach me at micah at thedebrief.org. I'd love to hear from you. To my lovely co-host, Johanna James, listen, I've got to ask you, Johanna, with all that we have seen this weekend, in terms of ancient knowledge, we know about potentially knowledge that's lost in modern times. Do you think that there's a lot of knowledge from the ancient past, in your own personal view and with your own research, that we have lost throughout time? And if so, could you give us an example of that? Lost knowledge. Easy question. Ah, not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think we've lost so much. I mean, just particularly in the, the physical evidence that we find in uh, like the bar bar and the vases. I know I could see on the lime stream, lime stream, live stream that people were already connecting the two and seeing the similar tool marks and the maths that was involved. And I was like, yeah, there was 100% in my mind some very, very, very clever people that existed way into our distant past. And we can see little sh shards of evidence. And we're just starting to put the puzzle pieces together and it's really exciting. And uh, I'm excited as well because I think next generation, we've got some absolute legends here today. And we've also got some, some newbies, some new young people who are coming into the fray as well. And we're all collectively working together. And I think we're gonna work it out. So I'm excited. I hope so. Yeah. Riffing on that question for a moment, let's make the microphone make its way down here to Praveen. I'd like Praveen's views on this. Praveen, in, in your opinion, do you think that some of the keys to lost knowledge can be found today? If so, what are they evidenced by? Where should we be looking? Also, I think we uh, lost common sense. Oh, there's that. <laughs> So, um, you know, I mean, obviously, we uh, 
We lost a bunch of ancient technology. We don't know how they built these amazing temples. Um, they could have used advanced technology and stuff like that. But what I find again and again is that we don't have the ability uh, to look at things deeply and understand them. Uh, we, we seem to have lost that ability over the period of centuries. Okay, now um, with um, the arrival of cell phones and high-speed internet, our attention span is getting reduced drastically, right? People no longer even watch like an hour-long video or 10-minute video. Now you guys watch like a one-minute video, right? <laughs> so in the next 10 years, you'll just watch like 10 seconds video. So, th so because of that reduced attention span, uh, we're not able to take a deeper look at the simple stuff, right? The stuff that already exists, and we're not able to decode them. So this is one of the things that uh, we could easily get it back, right? But um, on a serious note, uh, lots of things that um, have been lost. Uh, one is uh, to... Um, just the technology of how they built these ancient structures. For example, if you go to a particular temple called Hoysaleswara Temple in India, uh, this is a 900-year-old temple. We see pillars that are made. Um, they, they have these uh, turn marks. That, that means that the pillar can be made only using a lathe technology. Okay, you can only make these pillars using a rotating mechanism. And each pillar weighs uh, upwards of maybe 10, 20 tons. So you can imagine, uh, if you, most of you guys would have seen a lathe machine. So to just create a, a tiny little lathe job, you'd have to put it, you have to mount it on a machine and you would have to rotate it. So you can imagine what kind of technology they would have had to mount a 10-ton pillar and then rotate it to create pillars like that. So um, it's still out there. You can, if you just Google Hoysaleswara Temple in India, and you can say late machined pillars, archaeologists agree that, yes, these can be created only using late technology, but we don't know where um, those tools are. So this is a classic example of lost technology, okay? I want to get to some questions from the audience here in a moment, and I also want to plant a seed for a future question. While you've got the microphone, Praveen, when we look at the ancient Hindu epics, the Rig Veda and the Ramayana, and we hear about the weapon of Indra, the iron thunderbolt, and we, we hear about this pillar of smoke rising, does this ever sound reminiscent, and again, a quick answer from you because I'm planning a seed for a future question for some of our other panelists, but does, could this sound like a cataclysmic event in the ancient world described in epic literature? Yeah, it could be. I mean, um, what it is is uh, um, the, the god of uh, rain and thunderstorm has a weapon called Vajra, okay? And this weapon can create an incredible amount of energy, that it can produce so much energy, and uh, it produces more energy than a bolt of thunder. So um, using this, um, they destroyed cities, for example. Okay? And um, another uh, weapon they talk about is called the Brahmastra. This is the most common one. Uh, this is the weapon of Brahma, and then if you look at the ancient texts, they talk about um, how this astra destroyed an entire city. They go into uh, great detail explaining how this uh, weapon caused destruction, okay? So for example, they talk about how loud it was, how it uh, brightened up the entire place. It, people almost felt like there was another sun rising. Uh, the, the smoke cloud went up to the, to the sky, and all the plants and animals were destroyed in that area. So we can understand that the Brahmastra was very similar 
um, to a modern day nuclear weapon, okay? Um, it, it's a weird, if, if it was just a piece of fiction, I mean, they did a very good job because what they're explaining is very similar to an atom bomb. But the Vajra that we're talking about, you know, what he mentioned, um, the Vajra weapon um, is very similar to, uh, let's say, a Tesla coil. Um, and they also talk about vidyut in ancient texts, um, which is electricity. They also talk about electricity in ancient texts. Uh, so it is very similar. Malcolm loves this stuff because he keeps going back to uh, Vajra and vidyut because he's, he's inspired by the Vedic texts, you know? Right? We'll uh, get Malcolm's perspective on that here in a minute. I'd be very interested in hearing that. But first, Haley, I want to come over to you. When we, when we talk about the possibility of lost knowledge, uh, and maybe both you and Scott can speak to this point, is it possible that some of the lost knowledge isn't really lost? It's been intentionally hidden. For instance, think about Gobekli Tepe, intentionally buried, right? Some ancient sites have been intentionally buried, intentionally preserved, perhaps protected from something. And this kind of dovetails with what Robert Schock spoke about. But in, in the opinion of, of you and, and Scott Walter, could some of that information have been encrypted, hidden intentionally, but if those who know how to access the information, it's not hidden forever. It's accessible, but hidden only to a few. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. There's, this, is, this is a question that is like an onion, and it has multiple layers. And I think this is applicable to multiple cultures and multiple traditions, because this is the case in so many different, I wouldn't say religions, but different cultures around the world and different practices, because we see this at places like Gobekli Tepe. We see this in traditions like the Templar Order and the Atlanteans. And I'll let Scott add more onto this. Okay. Well, it's funny you bring that up because I was just having a conversation with a friend um, about some lost texts that have suddenly in the last few years, a couple of years have appeared to us. It's called the Book of the Wars of the Lord. And it wasn't until these new documents came forward that included all this material about Oak Island that I talked about tonight, but there's also this reference to the Book of the Wars of the Lord, which is something that goes back to biblical times and beyond. But if you Google right now, you pull up your phone and Google the Book of the Wars of the Lord, it will tell you that there is no extant copy known to exist today. But in fact, now it has come forward to us. And what is, what is in that is really profound. And it also, when you look at it, you understand why it's been hidden for so long. But maybe now is the time. It seems to be. So... So it's not just that, but going back to also the topic of the sacred feminine, we're in this time right now where this a reemergence of the sacred feminine, because let's face it, she has been suppressed for a very, very long time. And we're in this age now, the age of Aquarius, where it's the return of the feminine. And it's not just the return of the feminine, but it's the restoration of balance between the feminine and the masculine. And in the Book of the Wars of the Lord, one of the things that's mentioned is the goddess wisdom, the consort of our Lord. And she comes out, and she makes quite a display, and she is protecting her people. And this is... And there's one more part. Let me, let me tell them that. Right. All right, I'll hand it back over to All Scott right. for this. No, Haley makes a good point. One of the things that appears in the Book of the Wars of the Lord is that... <clears throat> The feminine aspect of the Godhead is on an equal plane with the male aspect, this whole concept of dualism. Yeah, and it's, it's profound. And, of course, we know there are certain powers that be that don't want to talk about this. But the other really important thing that comes out of the Book of the Wars of the Lord, which is unmistakable, is E.T.'s. And in 1898, when this <clears throat> book was hidden, it was given 
the only way we can interpret it, this information was given back to the ETs because the world wasn't ready. And what I want to believe is that this material that was protected by the Templars, and, and Tim, if you want to jump on this, you certainly can, but it's interesting that now it's coming forward. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Haley mentioned the change of the age from Pisces to Aquarius. We are now living in a profound moment in human history. And I don't think it's a coincidence that these unmistakable truths are coming forward. And in my opinion, in the nick of time. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Scott, I, I will. got some fans out there. Tim, since he, he, was, he was pitching it over to you, we haven't heard much from you this weekend. Tim Hogan, why don't you jump in on that right there? Is this working? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, you know, I'll just point out that the, the Templars have been trying to preserve information for centuries, uh, including texts. Uh, we were just talking about how even at, uh, right outside of Gobleki Tepe, there's, there's literally Templar graffiti from a thousand years ago. So that just shows how long, even though it was kind of rediscovered recently, it had been, looking, been looked at for a long time. Um, related to that somewhat, um, I, I, I will say there, there's more to come out from Egypt. Um, most people, when they think of the Templars, they think of them down in uh, Jerusalem, uh, in, in the Holy Land but uh, they spent considerable time in Egypt. And in fact, if you go to pretty much all the uh, major temples in Egypt, you'll find Templar graffiti from a thousand years ago. And one of the, uh, one of the things that we're, we're pretty much certain of that'll be coming out in the years ahead is that the Valley of the Kings was originally uh, constructed as survival bunkers from the cataclysm. Sounds similar to another idea. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all connected by tunnels, tunnel networks. There's vast tunnel networks between Saqqara and Giza. And that, uh, and this is where places like the Serapium exist. Um, but there's also graffiti, well not graffiti, there's, there's preservation by the pharaohs, even late kingdom pharaohs, in those tombs talking about the Zeptepi time, the first time where people came out of, and they depict things like uh, woolly mammoths and giant sloths on leashes. And uh, this, uh, we know that the Egyptians didn't have woolly mammoths or, or giant sloths. They were trying to preserve the memory of the time, and this is really why the pharaohs were, were buried there. And that's, I guarantee you, this is going to come out more in the years ahead. So this is an example of knowledge that's being preserved. Um, the Book of the Wars of the Lord, another one, it, it talks about the goddess Sophia, wisdom. And, uh, and, it, and it does, it talks about UFO activity, uh, interfering in human activity. Uh, and we have evidence as well as as late as the 1500s of surviving Templar networks incorporating these images and paintings that are found in Germany. So we're trying to make all this stuff available and uh, we'll be making more of it available in the years ahead. Um, and uh, certainly the work of conferences like this is great because it uh, it, it just raises the awareness of what was going on. I mean, if 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 20 years ago we were to say, oh, the, you know, the, the cataclysm, the flood was real, Atlantis, you know, or, or whatever was, you know, there, there was this mass cataclysm, and we know it's real, people would look at us like we were nuts. But because of the research that's come out in more recent years, yeah, it's, 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 it's proving all of this. And, uh, and I think it'll continue to be more so in, in the years ahead. So it's very exciting. Thank you, Tim Hogan. Uh, Kyle, I want to come over to you on a sonic note here. Are the Snake Brothers tuning your guitars to 432 hertz? Nope. <laughs> we haven't done that. I mean, I've tried it before, but I didn't notice anything immediately other than that uh, my tuners don't work after that. 
Do you think, though, that on a serious note, that the, when it comes to the intonation, I mean, we can, we can preserve ideas in oral traditions that are carried throughout time without written language. Could song do the same thing? Hmm. I think that uh, music can encode mathematics, and that is somewhat of a universal language. So I don't know about... Um, Spiritual concepts other than, for some reason, a minor chord strikes a sadness feeling, a major chord, a happiness or elated feeling, and it seems to be um, universal as well throughout cultures that those create that feeling within us. So I don't know what that connection is with music and how we feel or interpret the sounds. But uh, maybe there is a way to combine them that can preserve knowledge over time. And I think even perhaps uh, the classical composers were on to this. And they used so many different instruments, which provided all the different tenors, the different tonality, uh, and were able to create almost a revolution in their time and bring people to tears. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's possible. I, I hope an era like that comes back to our modern music. If language fails, hopefully mathematics will work when we meet E.T., and if that fails, then maybe music. Let's go to a question from our audience here. Sir, if you don't mind, if you can address uh, individual speakers, if possible, anybody who has questions, we'll like to try and get a few of these in. Make your way to the microphones if you have questions. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who to ask this question to, but it's sort of a follow-up of a uh, discussion uh, you were just having. It, it seems like it's pretty easy to lose uh, perhaps some ancient knowledge, but in the uh, stonework uh, in, uh, in Egypt, there seems to be ample evidence of the use of a high technology core drill and also evidence of a truly massive uh, circular saw type cutter uh, in the stone. How come we have never found any of these tools which would be, seem to be harder to lose than knowledge? Ben, you wanna take that one? I'll give it a run. Thank you. Yeah. Try it. <laughs> no, you're right. There's, so we, we have the witness marks for a lot of these tools that indicate, you know, some sophisticated things were going on. And you're right also that we haven't found the tools. I think there's a couple of um, explanations for it. I mean, the first one I'd say is if these, anything is made of metal, like it's, I tried to make this point in my talk, that, that metal is extremely precious. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a rare thing to find it on these ancient sites. Uh, you could take pretty much all of the metal that's been found in ancient Egypt across, you know, all of the sites that we've dug up and fit it into a pretty small room. Uh, it, not including things like gold, like things that can't be gold is useless as a tool. Uh, you know, it's, it's valued for other reasons, decorative, it doesn't oxidize, stuff like that. But in terms of metals that can be used for tools, I mean, that's the nature of the Bronze Age. If, if that metal, if you find it and it's, you know, it's not in the shape that you want it to be, then it's going to be taken, broken down, resmelted, reshaped into something else and just reused until it's gone. Uh, you also, a lot of these other metals do suffer from things like oxidation, uh, where they will just turn away and rust and or just disappear, turn into dust over time. Uh, I suspect that's the case. I mean, we found some indication of you know, sophisticated mechanisms and tools. One, things I'd, one of the things I'd point to is like the Antikythera mechanism, if you've ever heard of that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. The only reason we have that is because it was underwater. It was found in a shipwreck. And even though it's being affected by, you know, seawater and it, is, it was being degrade, degraded and there was growths and all sorts of things happening to it, the, the, we, I think even people that... I guess that, that don't accept that there was anything advanced going on, it would probably tell you there was, there was probably multiple of these things. It wasn't just a one-off piece. There was probably a whole bunch of them. But the only one we found is the one that happened to have sunk on a shipwreck. All of the rest of them probably got reused, melted down, and, and reshaped into other things. Uh, the other um, angle on this that I would take is it's much like an analogy to a modern job site. 
uh, builders, when they build a house or they build a location, they typically, they don't, when the job's done, they don't just leave their tools there, they take them with them. So, you know, looking on these sites where these tools were used may not be the right place to be looking for them. Um, they may all have been taken somewhere else. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a valid question. It's like, where are the tools? It's one I hear all the time. But, it, yeah, I, I suspect it's a combination of those factors. And when you throw in a potential sort of, a, you know, extreme age for some of that things, it's just we're not going to find them. We, there's no doubt that those tools were used, though. We do have the witness marks. Uh, there was some sort of tubular drill, as you said, that was used into this stone. It's definitely not a grinding process that was done that, 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 that did that. Even the suggested approach from, I guess, mainstream archaeology and saying, well, this was done with, you know, these marks were made with, with copper uh, uh, tubes that were grinding into sand or, or copper drag bars that were dragging with sand. They've, they found literally zero of those things as well. Like, there's no actual tool in the archaeological record that explains them under anyone's explanation. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's it. It's just, it, it's a mystery as to where those tools are. But they were used. I mean, we have the witness marks for them. This gentleman over here, let's go over to this microphone, please. And if you have a question specifically that you can address to anyone, that's great. Otherwise, yeah. we'll try and find a panelist who can answer. Go ahead. Okay, it's, it's actually for you, Ben. Um, kind of follow up. So we've discussed like precision of the tools that were probably used um, and also like a lot of things, but um, I'm a software developer, and I'm thinking, even if you have the great tools to do this stuff, like, you probably need software. You need to create, like, 3D renderings. You need to be able to, like, communicate that to the machines. Is there any evidence of computing of, you know, any of, any of that? Yeah, in fact, there is. If I would encourage anyone who's interested in learning more about this, and particularly this evidence has come up with the Vasecan project, to go and find Mark Vist's article. It's on unsigned.io. That's the website. I've referenced it on my page. I've written about it. It's in my videos. But if you just search like unsigned.io space granite, the, the article's called Abstractions in Granite. And one of the things that he talks about is, is you know, we talked about in the chat that these, these vases show significant evidence for design. Like, the, you know, that vase, you, you see the replicas that have been floating around. It's, it's that first vase is literally like this big. It's very small. And you have features in that vase that match these radial traversal patterns, the mathematical formula that's behind it, that are as small as 1.1 millimeters, like a radius that's one just over a millimeter. You try and draw a circle with the finest tip pencil you can get and the, and the nicest paper, it's going to be very difficult to draw. Uh, of course, if you scale it up in a big piece of paper like this stage, you can draw it, but it still has to be scaled back down at some point. Um, and I think there's, a, given that, you know, Mark also, once he found that radial traversal pattern that matches those features of the vase, he used it to then create a mathematical model of the vase. You compare that model to the scan of the real artifact, the median radial deviation, something like six microns. So essentially the vase is a almost or basically perfect replication of this design. And this is where his logic goes in this article. And it's, it's astonishing. It's that in order to get from design to output, given that it was designed, the only mechanism that we know of today, the only phenomenon, natural or otherwise, that can do that, that can, can take data, can, can like operate on it in a, in a state and produce an output, it's a Turing machine. So we, you know, we, call, we call them computers today to do that. You can make them mechanically, pneumatically, hydraulically, electronically like we do. Uh, it may not have been a Turing machine like we use them, but that seems to have been an essential part of that process in terms of getting to it. Now, hopefully over time, as we expand the data set on the vases, one thing that's going to show this out a little more, we're already seeing similarities between the vases in terms of like, hey, the radial traversal patterns showing up, that same fixed ratio in the, in the, the various geometric primitives are showing up in multiple vases. But as we expand that data set and get into like museums to scan their, um, their items, I'm really interested to see is like, do we see the same shape, the exact same vase shape, right? It might scale up or down in size, but do we have the same sort of geometric principles and, and, and shapes in the vases? Because then we know there's actually a design that's been stuck to. I can tell you from just eyeballing them and from pictures, there's a lot of vases that look very, very similar to each other that seem to have been the same pattern reused again. So, yeah, I think the only way you go from design to output with the sort of precision we're talking about requires a Turing machine. It's, it's, it's hard to defeat his logic, and it is astonishing. It take, it, his article takes a little bit of reading, but I'd really encourage anyone to, to take a look at it if they can. 
Let's go over here, uh, gentlemen, sir. Go ahead. My, minor follow-up for Ben. Since we don't have any of those coring tools, from the witness that is left, can we determine the thickness of the core drill? Yeah, yeah. There's, so there's a, there's a number of different hole, like two, the, the actual holes that are left uh, in the stone. So at the very base where they snap off that the granite core that's left, you do have, you know, a, an indication of tool thickness, and it's it's very thin. You'll see even in the very large one, there's one at Karnak that's like nine inches, and it's it's a remarkably thin tool tip. I don't know if anyone's actually measured it yet. It's one of the things we're trying to do by using photogrammetry and trying to get as much data as we can about these holes. We might be able to determine things like that, but I can tell you that it's any suggestion that something as soft as copper or bronze would have been able to go through this at the rate it seems to have, it just it, it wouldn't be able to do it. But I think that's obtainable data. It just is going to take someone taking an interest that has access to go and actually I just wondered if anyone, scan the holes. It, anyone had taken it once you figure out the diameter and the thickness of the core drill, try to figure out metallurgically what metal would be capable yeah. of being used to make that kind of cut. Well, or what technique. I mean, I think that's not just metal. I don't know if it's just a metal technique. One of the things that, that Chris Dunn does explore in that is like the, the, the possibility of other forms of machining, like electrical discharge machining or sonic machining or some other technique that's been used to cut it other than just purely abrasive sort of turning and cutting. I don't know. It's, that's all, that all comes down to more study. I can tell you one thing I'm that's going to happen in the near future is I do have access to some fragments which have marks of tool drills in them. Uh, and I've got some people that have uh, a couple of electron scanning microscopes. So we're hoping to get some actual cut marks put under an electron scanning microscope to see if there are any fragments or anything we can determine that might be residual left in that cut that shows, OK, this was a metal or was a material that might have been used to cut it. So we're a question that. quickly from our live audience here, and this one is for Dr. Robert Schock. Following up on your session there, Dr. Schock, is there evidence that some of the burnt statues we find at ancient locations like Egypt, crumbling blocks and the like, could a CME, a, uh, a coronal mass ejection, have potentially caused that? The, the, the question is, could some of the degradation we have seen of statues and blocks, yeah. megalithic structures and things, and also, uh, for instance, statues in ancient Egypt, could a CME have potentially caused that? Could the CME have? Did a CME potentially cause some of the destruction? Oh, yeah. Okay, of, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I apologize. My hearing is, especially with the reverberation. Yeah, so the question is, could CME have caused some of that? Yes, I think absolutely yes could be the case. In fact, what we're finding, um, Katie and I, and as we travel through Egypt, that there's more and more evidence for this, and there's more and more evidence that good chunks of Egypt, if I could put it that way, or when I say chunks of Egypt, um, uh, different aspects of Egypt, different monuments, statues, etc. they are not the traditional dating. They go back to a much earlier period. They were being used and reused. There's lots of evidence that pharaohs would carve their names on older structures, older statues, etc. Um, we agree that, for instance, the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens, that probably started out as something very different, as shell uh, so yes, I think we're finding lots of evidence of vitrification, of we'll call it burning, of scoria, of marks that go back to a much earlier period. Um, Egypt, what we're finding is that Egypt was not just from dynastic times, let's say 3100 BCE, up to the present or the classical Egyptian um, empire and kingdoms uh, from 3100 BC up to Ptolemaic period. But as the Egyptians themselves said, there was a much earlier period. They refer to Zeptepi. We have the Atlantis story from Egypt. We have things like the Hawara Labyrinth, which seems to go back to earlier period. So we have all this evidence, and this ties in with something I mentioned very briefly, where we have this mud brick packing that Katie actually first observed um, around all these different sites where it looks like they were intentionally covering over and burying and trying to preserve earlier structures. So I am... I think we're now putting together a much more comprehensive picture. It's not to deny any of the dynastic Egyptians, but goes back so much further 
than that. Um, a quick, not to beat this into the ground, but a quick analogy might be something like the Colosseum in Rome. We all know the Colosseum in Rome. Um, goes back to the first century AD, 10,000, 12,000 years from now, people, archaeologists are digging it up. They find 21st century coins in it. Are they going dead to the 21st century? Because I'll, you know, so these things were being reused. Also, I wanted to um, make a couple of other points. Ancient knowledge, we were talking about ancient knowledge. Well, yes, we can interpret ancient knowledge from sites and from alignments and all this um, good stuff. And I don't mean that in any negative way. I mean, absolutely we can. But there's also, I think, potentially a repository that may have a lot of clues in it. That is that chamber under the Sphinx that may be a real hall of records. Um, another possibility I already mentioned a few seconds ago is the labyrinth um, outside the uh, Hawara by the so-called Pyramid of Hawara. Just two examples. So I think there's a lot of possibilities there. I've got to call a lifeline here. My old pal, George Howard, would you like to do a follow-up follow there? <clears throat> Thanks, Robert. I want to point out, um, I didn't see all your presentation. I look forward to seeing it later. But when we step out of this room, we've got a big 55-inch TV back there watching it, too. So when you don't see me in here, I don't want to think you didn't. I wasn't watching. But <clears throat> factions amongst intellectual allies drive me crazy. And it's a sociological phenomenon that people that largely agree together can certain can become the most fractious, in a sense, even though they may move forward. I consider all of us here catastrophists, and there's a factional nature to it, if there often is with human nature, between comets and the sun. This probably doesn't represent proper scientific methodology, but would you agree to a temporary narrative that comets started the Younger Dryas and the sun ended it? No. <laughs> no, because I think you missed my presentation, that portion of it maybe. That's why I set myself up to be yeah, ignorant yeah. of it. I, 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 no, no, seriously, yeah. I have nothing against comets, and what I was trying to propose is that my working hypothesis, and I do believe the evidence fits this best, is that the Younger Dryas began and end be, ended because of solar outbursts. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation. No, 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 no. I was proposing a compromise. What? Not, not your hypothesis. Neither? I, w I was proposing a compromise, a narrative compromise. A narrative not compromise. Not one person's hypothesis or the other. Wait, wait, wait. You're, I, I lost it a little bit. You're, I thought you were saying Younger Dries began with a comet and it was all. That's right. OK, but. It's what? probably what happened. That's good. No, no. I, I, <laughs> No, no, let me, I, I'm not sure where, I'm, where we're going with this, but to me, um, uh, science is based on evidence, not compromise. <laughs> no, and I, I think, no, I mean that seriously, and I get really frustrated, and I'm not criticizing anyone here. My point is that in my own mind, in my own analysis, et cetera, there's so much good evidence that's come out of comet research, but I think it can also be explained by solar oh, Absolutely, outbursts. Robert, and I want to make very, very clear, I'm much more scared of the sun than I am of any comets. Oh, absolutely. Okay? As anybody who but has I'm, studied this stuff knows. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not trying to scare anybody. But, but, and scared we're not me. arguing about this. We're having a wonderful conversation. Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of all the evidence, I yeah. don't deny it, but I think it can also be explained by a solar outburst. Then you have other data that really is better explained by a solar outburst. But I want to make two points in general. Maybe Briefly, because I want to turn it over to um, yeah, Dr. Daniel. I, yeah, because you don't compromise in science. You follow the evidence. And if you have to change your mind, you change your mind. Also, um, a lot of people say to me, well, why don't you just have a jury? You don't decide things by vote in science. Um, it's not a popularity contest. You really have to look at the evidence. And also, you don't do things in science, in my opinion, by common sense. I mean, common sense, if we just used common sense, quote unquote, we still think that the sun goes around But the that's Earth. what Solomon did when he split the baby. What? You just got to make a call, you know, and then put everybody. But Randy, yeah. what do you have to offer? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yeah, I was very interested in um, uh, Dr. Schott's idea about the plasma uh, being a, a factor in the Younger Dryas. And so I was thinking about this, and this may not be a compromise, but in, in the end, it seems that if it's a, a plasma force or a cosmic, 
in the end, that's a distinction without a difference in terms of its effect. Would, would you say that? Oh, yeah. The effect is there. Yeah, right. The so, effect is absolutely there. There was a right. huge catastrophe at yeah, the right. beginning of the Younger Dries and a huge one at the end of the Younger Dries. Absolutely. Okay. So would the, would the plasma, I'm still trying to understand the plasma, would that also be sort of a multi-continent level? level? Absolutely. In fact, uh, 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 a solar plasma event would absolutely be multi-continent um, synchronous synchronous it, around the world much more so than a comet which would be tend to be more localized right um, and, depending and, on the comet and the size etc if it was large enough to be as encompassing as I've heard some and not you personally but some comet people suggest I'll just use that term generally I mean, we'd be wiped out from the yeah, comet, right. but a solar event explains it. Right. And all the proxies that have been proposed for a, a comet, that, that all those are consistent? They are consistent with solar. With solar. Platinum, too. Absolutely. So how then, so if, if it's a, um, a distinction without a difference, at some level it would really be good to, to make a distinction. So given that the proxies are similar in both cases, how would you determine whether it was a solar event. Oh, I, I, part of it you just hit upon uh, being worldwide, et cetera. I think a solar event explains better the breaking of the ice dams and the changing climate at the beginning of the Younger Dries. Um, no one's ever, to my knowledge, proposed a comet at the end of the Younger Dries, which is really was my initial uh, interest. Also, uh, the uh, Peratt's work on plasma petroglyphs is not comet at all, but that does tie in with solar. So things like that. All right. Um, again. I do think it's a distinction, but when you are talking about that there's a huge cataclysm bounding both the beginning and the end of the Younger Drives, there's a huge cataclysm, absolutely. Okay. It's like, you know, maybe it's equivalent to, was it dynamite versus um, uh, a nuclear bomb? I don't know, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. What, Thank what's, you. what's, am you I making what? some sense? Yeah, no, yeah, I've, yeah I've, I've appreciate, got that. appreciate Gentlemen, that clarification. we could go on all night like this, but, but we, I do want to try and get a couple more questions from our audience in here. So much spirited debate going on up here, and this, this is part of the scientific process, too, so especially among two uh, esteemed colleagues and scientists like this. Now listen, right down here, gentlemen, uh, this, right, right there, you, yes, sir. If you will step up to the microphone with your question. Let's go ahead and get two more from the audience and then a final word from our panelists here before we wrap things up. Go ahead. Yeah, this is, um, whoa. This is uh, very, very uh, apropos to the conversation about impacts versus solar, uh, solar outbursts. But uh, has there been any research, uh, Randall, I watched some of Randall's content years ago, and I found it so fascinating. It was about Burkle Crater in the Indian Ocean and the Madagascar chevrons. So my understanding is that that's a 29-kilometer diameter impact at the bottom of Indian Ocean that's 5,000 years old. I'd like to know if there's any thoughts from appropriate panel members up here about what type of impact that would have had on global civilization 5,000 years ago and uh, why there's not more research about it, because uh, it seems like an 18-mile diameter impactor at the bottom of the Indian Ocean is kind of a big deal. Indeed. Since seems you mentioned like Randall, Randall, I'm going to pitch that one to you, sir. Go ahead. Well, I haven't seen any recent research on that to verify that it is, in fact, an impact crater on the bottom of the ocean. Um, it's very suggestive. The, the main problem, I think, with doing research on it is it is two miles under the ocean. Um, but there are chevrons around all of the continental margins of the planet that are being found so that we know there have been large tsunamis, whether they're caused, you know, what the causative mechanism is is still an open suggestion. I think clearly seismic activity is a big driver of tsunamis, but also bolide impacts into the ocean. I mean, we do know that comets and asteroids strike the Earth and other planets, but in my in my t t approach to this, I'm looking for a unifying concept. I think we all up here are in agreement that there have been catastrophes. And I have long believed, even, even that's when I first heard Robert, I was gratified because I, um, <clears throat> I journeyed late 80s. I went, was in Europe, and I found what I thought was evidence from ancient records. Like, there's a place, Robert, you might know about the Ande Stone. 
Yeah, there's a there's a very angry sun depiction on there with two different types of rays coming out. Right. I remember uh, seeing that, what, 35 years ago or yeah, something, and yeah. at that point thinking, well, the sun is obviously a big factor here that yeah. we have to consider. Yeah, I also think I need to jump in here just for a second and say that when you have a major plasma strike that can cause craters, it can cause tsunamis, it can cause, and in fact, <laughs> um, if you even look at, like, for instance, technical studies of meteor crater, it, the conclusion was it was the shock wave that really created most of the crater, um, not the physical impactor, but the shock wave of it coming in. You get the same shock waves when you have essentially, you know, we'll call it lightning, but, you know, huge uh, plasma. And then I also want to point out um, uh, Randall's right. I mean, two miles under, et cetera. And do we know if it's a real crater? What type of crater? Craters form other ways from volcanic or outgassing, et cetera. Um, and then we also have to worry about the dating. So for instance, not to beat a dead horse, as I hate to say, um, but the Hiawatha crater was initially considered Pleistocene, and some people thought maybe even late Pleistocene. Now we know it's Paleocene. Um, uh, you know, over 50 million years earlier. So the dating on these things, we have to be very careful with, too. Indeed, we do. Let's go over to this gentleman right here. So my Maybe question, our final question this evening. My Sorry, question is for uh, no. Dr. Shock. While I find your CME plasma very intriguing, I'm definitely in uh, Team Comet. Um, <clears throat> Praveen's answer uh, brought a question to my mind. To what extent, and this is out of left field, but I need to ask the geologists in the room, to what extent do you think this catastrophic CME plasma event may have carved the Grand Canyon, and have you heard of that? Oh, sure, I've heard of that. And um, I think that there, okay, let me back up. There's a huge, um, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, on Mars, there's a huge canyon. Valles Marineris. It was just escaping my mind. Thank you. Uh, Valles Marineris. And there's a very strong argument that Valles Marineris on Mars. Did everyone know what I'm talking about? The huge, um, we'll call it like Grand Canyon type, but much, much larger, et cetera. Very strong argument. I think that that is plasma scarring. And you can see uh, very, what seem to be very diagnostic shapes on it, you know, from plasma scarring. And and there's been a lot of work uh, in laboratories of these types of phenomena. I had the opportunity, and I keep in contact with him, uh, uh, plasma physicist uh, C.J. Ransom, uh, PhD, plasma, PhD plasma physicist, who's done a lot of experimental day on this, of how you get craters, craters and scarring, et cetera. And you see these represented on Mars. You see these represent on Moon. And they're very well preserved there. Why? Because you don't have the same atmospheric conditions, as I mentioned during the talk, that erodes things away, uh, weathers and erodes it away, making that slight distinction. Um, but both occurs. Now, what we have on Earth is we lose a lot of those features because of the atmosphere we have with weathering and erosion and whatnot. So it's much more difficult to say on Earth. Um, and I honestly don't want to speak to something that I haven't studied specifically on the ground in the field in this context. So is it a possibility that we have some plasma scarring there? I think we have to at least keep an open mind and look at that. I've heard have people uh, very strongly support that with very good sound reasoning. Uh, it's something I'm looking at very seriously. And you know, you have a situation where you have a plasma scarring, and then of course the, it it makes a ready channel um, for water, and then you have continued erosion, you know, fluvial processes, et cetera, but may have originated one way and continued another way. So things like this are not simple geologically. There can be, you know, various factors involved, and this may be a long-winded way of saying that I don't know for certain, but I think it's something that we have to keep in mind and uh, keep an open mind about. Thank you. Indeed, one, indeed. Well, listen, wonderful panel. One I more, think, one have, more question. Do we have one more? One. We'll do one more. Can we make it quick? Okay. Very quick. Okay. I, I, my question is to Ben uh, and anybody else who's involved in megalithic structures. We talk a lot about the um, the tools that we use to carve these stones, and uh, and the evidence that we have, these markers that we have that show that these they were certain types of tools, they, were, they cut very quickly, they were very thin, 
And I, I'm always hearing people talk about how, what these tools could have been like. And I never hear anyone bring up the, the idea that maybe the stone wasn't so hard when it was, when it was carved. I can talk to that. I, oh, I mean, uh, I was uh, directing it to Ben. You might want to ask a geologist, what kind of stone are well, we talking I, about? I, I, <laughs> I, I, I get this from a, a book that I read where it talked about the ancients had the ability to make stone soft as clay, it, yeah, light as corn. That. Well, that sounds like alchemy, and that only applies to metal. No, no. Right? This is no, not, this is I'm only messing. Don't worry. But so very, very briefly, I'll, yeah, you can jump in just one sec. Quickly, yeah, it's, very quickly, if we can. Yeah, it's so. Uh, I don't. We, we just don't know. We don't have any explanation. We don't do that type of thing with stone right now, right? It's it's it would be pure speculation. I mean, intuitively, I can understand looking at some of the stonework in Peru that it looks like was this shaped by softening it. It's just. We have no evidence for it. We do have the tool marks and the machines, and this is kind of how we work in stone today. Is it a possibility? I like to keep an open mind, but I can, I just, not, as far as I know, there's no real evidence for how we would do that or how you can somehow molecularly soften okay. stone to make it easier to work. I don't know. Tim Hogan has a follow up. I, 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 I can speak on that. Um, so around Egypt, if you look around the, uh, the monuments, there's a, there's a particular plant species that grows that's called Dictopelatum in the, in the, in the modern vernacular, uh, the scientific vernacular. If you, if you do certain alchemical processes to this plant, which are outlined on the walls of the Egyptian temples, you can extract hydrofluoric acid from it. Hydrofluoric acid eats away at the silica and granite and actually causes it to melt. The only thing that, that the, the, the uh, hydrofluoric acid doesn't eat through is gold and beeswax, ironically. And they have found monuments in Egypt that were covered in beeswax initially. Uh, and, and of course, you could scrape away the beeswax to create templates, to create washes hmm. with the hydrofluoric acid to burn out the silica in the in the granite in order to literally melt it. And I think uh, th there will be uh, a lot more research on this in, in the years ahead. I, but, I take exception but, to that, Tim, because we're not, I'm, I'm, I'm asking about something that would change the state of the matter temporarily, because obviously it goes back to being hard and heavy again at some point. You're describing a chemical reaction. I think I'm talking more about something at the atomic level, something that would temporarily, my, there's a place called Carl Castle. This guy built a castle. Huh? Yeah. And he, he had a book called Magnetic Currents. And his belief was that all matter was made of magnetic particles that were like the skin on soap bubbles. And it would pull matter together and draw it to the ground. And if you could remove those magnetic particles for a time, you would make the stone soft as clay, light as cork. But that was an idea. Uh, briefly, I, I might interject. Ed Leedskallen also was really good with pivots and fulcrums. I've been there. I've, I've been there many times. Incredible I've stuff the, I've that he seen did. The video of him moving stones. Yeah. No, <clears throat> but, but again, I have to say. Can, that can I speak to this? Very it, briefly, and it, then let's I mean, wrap it, it up. Exotic Boy. vacuum objects, as determined by Ken Shoulders, <laughs> Acca plasmoids, uh, they have been shown, and you can see the scientific papers on this to bore through alumina, which is aluminium oxide, which is a major part of rock, and also silicon dioxide, which is quartz, which is a major part, part of rock. In the case of one experiment, he coated beeswax onto the surface of a piece of alumina, and the Evos bored a fully vitrified channel through the alumina and left a spread film underneath the beeswax. <laughs> so yes, there's, there's a technology that may be able to do that and the scientific papers that you can look at. Maybe it all comes down to the interpretation of the technology. Great question, thank you, very stimulating. Listen, everybody, we're way over, but we were having fun, right? Give us a little break here. And let's hear it for these fantastic panelists. Yeah.